<laughs> All right. So uh, today I've been asked to speak upon uh, identifying criminal and drug-related activities. Yeah. So obviously we can't talk about drug-related activities without talking about drugs. So some of the most common drugs that we're going to have here in this area are going to be marijuana, uh, methamphetamines, uh, prescription drugs, cocaine, crack cocaine, ecstasy, and heroin. So marijuana is probably the most popular drug, probably the most accessible here in Manhattan uh, due to its legalization, decriminalization in Colorado. You see a lot of that that will head this way in Manhattan. So kind of here's the, uh, the definition of uh, marijuana. It's a green leafy botanical substance, active ingredient is THC. That's what kind of gives you that, that uh, euphoric high, which attracts a lot of people. Uh, this is what the plant will look like itself. Um, what will happen is you'll have the buds that will actually grow and it'll look more like that and once that's dried out that's usually what the people will uh, use to smoke. Um, usually when we find it it's in that form there. It's got a pretty distinct skunk-like smell to it. Uh, some of the paraphernalia that we'll find associated with the use of marijuana that you may see in a house. Uh, pipes, uh, different variations of a pipe there. Uh, grinders. Uh, this is called a dugout. So a lot of times what people will do is they'll have, uh, this is actually a, a pipe right here. Put that in that little hole there, store the marijuana in there. Uh, and when they're ready to use it, they'll put the marijuana inside there and uh, smoke it through the pipe. Uh, zigzag papers that goes along with the, uh, the grinder. So they'll take those leaves, grind them up. Uh, roll them up in zigzag papers and uh, ingest it that way. Uh, digital scales, we get so a little bit more into the distribution when we're talking about digital scales. Um, a lot of people, when they're, when they're dealing drugs, they're really particular about the weights and they want to be exact because they're making their money that way. Uh, methamphetamines is probably the second most popular drug that you'll see in Manhattan, probably one of the most dangerous. It's a stimulant drug used, used as a white, bitter tasting powder or a pill. Crystal methamphetamine is a form of a drug that looks like a glass like fragments or shiny, uh, bluish white rocks. It is chemically similar to amphetamines, which is a drug that's used to treat attention deficit disorder and uh, some sleep disorders. So, usually, when we find paraphernalia that's associated with the use of methamphetamines, you're going to see a lot of small baggies with uh, a little bit of crystal shards through the area there. This is the actual amphetamines, but because it's actually broken up, it's gonna kind of distribute through the, uh, the baggie on the edges there. So we usually see a lot of things like that. Uh, here's some other examples with a little bit of more different forms that you may see. These are all crystal methamphetamines. Usually ingested by a glass pipe, pretty thin uh, pipe there, so they'll put the crystal meth in there, heat it up with a lighter, and then ingest it into the body. Uh, occasionally, you'll have uh, some people that'll actually use a spoon and syringes, and these syringes, we find these everywhere. Uh, houses, cars, I think they're probably the most successful ones to get. You can pick them up over at uh, Walgreens, uh, but they'll put the meth on the uh, spoon, heat it up, and then, then inject it into their body. Usually associated with a kit, something like this, where you'll have your spoon, your syringes, uh, glass pipes, uh, and then they'll keep their baggies down here uh, with uh, their meth. Now when we start talking about meth labs, these are kind of some of the precursors that you may see if somebody's actually been manufacturing methamphetamines. Uh, usually you have uh, acetone, um, this is live. I think it's a drain cleaner. Um, heat. You have your Sudafed tablets. And there's basically a chemical process where they go and they separate uh, one of the active ingredients inside of the ephedrine tablets, pseudoephedrine. So they separate the ephedrine out and use that uh, to make crystal methamphetamine. So if you're seeing a lot of things like this in any of your tenants' apartment, this is indicative of a meth lab. A lot of times what they'll do when they're separating it is they'll put it into some sort of like two liter container, put a hose on top of it and let it bleed out. 
So they'll take lithium strips out of batteries, and lithium is a soft metal uh, that's highly flammable. So when, they, when they're doing the chemical reactions, they gotta keep this rolling here, the rolling reaction to keep it from blowing up. And what it can actually do, if that sits too long and starts to, uh, to fester, blow up and catch fire fairly easily and, and take down a house in just a matter of time. So usually when you find meth labs, special teams have to go in in special suits, remove these things from the house. Um, sometimes the houses are condemned until they can either be professionally cleaned up and some of them can actually never even get lived in again. When I talked about the two liters with the bleed off, this is kind of what I'm talking about here. They'll usually have some sort of plastic container with a, with a bleed off there. Um, and this would be where they would put the lithium strips in there from the batteries. Prescription pills, so we have uh, opioid stimulants, central nervous system depressions. Um, some example of opioids, hydrocodone, oxymorphone, morphine, codeine, fentanyl. Fentanyl is probably one of the, the most recent dangerous drugs. It only takes a very finite amount of this, like a couple grains of salt as an equivalent to kill you. Um, in some of the bigger cities, officers will, will carry an auto injector pen, um, essentially to counteract that opioid overdose that you're gonna have there. There has been cases where people have actually walked into a house, got a little bit of fentanyl on the bottom of their boots, gone home to their families, and had a small child. Small child was crawling on the floor, had made contact with the child and killed the child. So, I mean, this is, this is stuff not necessarily to joke around with. It's, it's pretty dangerous. So we have stimulants. This is, a lot of times your study drugs, your Adderall, Ritalin, things like that. And then you have your uh, central nervous system uh, depressants, your benzodiazepine. So we've all probably seen these. Maybe some of us have been prescribed these from the doctor, but these are the, the most common ones for abuse. Have your non benzodiazepine. These are sedatives, your sleep drugs, Ambien, Lunesta. Your barbiturates. Cocaine. White powdery substance. A lot of times you'll find this uh, mixed together with methamphetamine. Kind of an example there of what cocaine would look like. Might find it in a little small bag similar to what you might find some crystal methamphetamine in. That's what it will actually look like if you see it outside of the, the powder itself. Cocaine is usually snorted, so they'll have a, a mirror, lay out some lines, separate it, and uh, snort it up with a straw. It can also be injected, kind of the same principle. You have the spoon heated up, turns into a liquid, put it into a syringe, inject it into your arm. But crack cocaine, a little bit more potent. A lot more risk that goes with it. It's anywhere from between 75 to 100% more pure than uh, regular cocaine. God's name, uh, crack cocaine, because of the cracking sound that it makes when it's uh, cooked. It's usually the form that it'll take. There's a lot of crossover with the paraphernalia that you'll see. So this is, uh, again, a glass pipe. They'll put the crack rock in there, heat it up with the lighter, ingest it into their body that way. Spoons, also indicative of uh, drug paraphernalia. A lot of times when they're doing the cooking themselves, what they'll do is they'll take either cigarette butts or cotton and use that kind of as a makeshift filter. As they're pulling that, uh, the drugs out with, uh, with the syringe, they're kind of filtering some of the contaminants that might be in there because I mean, we all know this isn't necessarily made you know, in, a, in a lab somewhere where we respect 
you know, health for everybody. This is usually made in somebody's house, and you know, I mean, most of you guys have have tenants, and you've been inside some of the houses for inspections, and you know, people don't necessarily take care of things the way that you would want them to take care of them. Ecstasy, also known as MDMA. One of those drugs that alters your mood. Gives you increased uh, energy, pleasure, emotion. Distorts your uh, sensory and time perception. It's usually taken in pill format. So what people will do, this is how they brand their drugs. So you'll see something that says UPS, YouTube, Gold, uh, Warner Brothers, and I mean, they look like kids' vitamins. But this is how, when somebody is wanting to buy stuff, that they, they know that they're getting the brand that they want from the dealer that they want. You may get something that you're going to be all right with taking this because you got it from a, because the batch isn't consistent. You might not get enough of the MDMA in there, but you may have a pill from the same batch that was maybe at the bottom, and you're going to get everything that's settled down in there, so it's really easy to overdose on things like that. <clears throat> Heroin, it's an opioid again, made from morphine, comes from the poppy plant, which is indigenous to uh, Southeast Asia, Mexico, Colombia, and it varies in color from uh, a black tar heroin all the way to white. So this is some samples of, these are all heroin. So if you've ever seen anything like this, just know that that's potentially what it could be. This is the paraphernalia that's associated with spoons, candles, syringes, usually some sort of cellophane to uh, hold and store the actual heroin itself. So drug-related suspicious activity. So if you think that somebody might be stealing <coughs> drugs, one of the things that you're gonna be looking for is vehicles that are coming and going throughout the day. The durations of the stops are very short. Car pulls up, somebody goes in, somebody comes out, they leave, and they never come back. And this may occur throughout the day. It may occur at weird hours during the day, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Kind of the same thing goes with foot traffic. A lot of times people walk in with bags, go inside a house, drug transaction goes up down, and they're out of there. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand trades. Somebody from the house might actually come out and meet somebody on the street, shakes hands, they walk different directions. That's indicative of a drug deal. Um, <coughs> if somebody's a dealer, one of the things that is a telltale sign is that they're able to afford things that maybe the rest of us with jobs wouldn't be able to afford. <laughs> you know, so if they're not working and they've got a 65 inch TV and an iPhone 10 and, you know, Xboxes and things like that, but they don't have a job, that could be one of the indicators there that uh, somebody might be dealing drugs. An airplane, and he's at the warehouse every day and night. Hysterical behavior, psychotic behavior, doesn't want us, we do the apartments and houses during the day, to go over there either dealing eBay or getting ready for the next day at night. Doesn't want us to have 24 hour access. Call the cops on us, because we have 24 hour access. They're tripping the breakers in the units, in their units, wanting to change the breakers out for more power. Their doors are never open. Ours are always up and open. Mm -hmm. we, when the cops came out, we let them come through our units. The hysterical people, that didn't happen in their units. The neighbors are even talking about the traffic at night, like you talk about. Mm -hmm. After we leave, yeah. I did 50 years down in Miami, there's a lot of money. Oh, absolutely. And people, I mean, they make, this is how they make their money. So they're willing to do a lot of things to protect themselves and not, you know, cooperate in you know, do those things that most of us would do if we didn't have anything to hide. 
when they uh, know we're watching them now, they, I think you'd say abandoned, but they're not there that we can tell mm -hmm. on those three units. They're still paying, they still got the airplanes, you know, the whole routine. I think they've just moved some other units or houses or whatever. Here in Manhattan, Manhattan. Oh, yes, airport. absolutely. Have you spoken with the police? Oh, department? yeah, they had two cops out there who walked them all through the whole thing, and the neighbors are watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they usually come in the van at night with no headlights down through the neighborhood. Headed right to the warehouse. Addy? Addy Road? Are they going down Addy Road? Is that the name of that? Well, there's Eureka, and then there's that little loop there that's right across from Job Corps. Oh, no. No, this is a different part of town. Different part this of town? Not Manhattan Airport? No, no, not Manhattan Airport. This is south of town, yeah. We can it's, talk later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm 50 years in Miami, I've seen it all. You know, right away, the plane and the hysterical behavior, thinking they're right and worrying the intruders with 24 hour access to the, to the warehouse. One of the other things that you'll see is that you have these exaggerated security measures. Mm -hmm. Tin foil over the windows, windows are blacked out, uh, padlocks on the doors, excessive locks, cameras. Most people don't have a lot of cameras at every single door, windows are barred, things like that. The uh, odors, if you're smelling some weird odors that you've never been able to, to determine what it is, more than likely that's drug related. Even blue insulation all around the windows, that's a grow room. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I'd be curious what the electric bill would be. <laughs> well, now that they got LEDs, you know, charcoal filters. So when we start talking about suspicious people, people that are outside of the house, they're parked in their cars. Now I'm gonna add a disclaimer in this. Sometimes they might be undercover cops. <laughs> <laughs> so, in some cases, it's best not to approach the people, you know, because it's really hard if somebody who's done surveillance. It's really hard to, to watch a house and then somebody walks by and then try to act like you're doing normal things in your car in this big van is real with somebody else in the passenger seat and the car's out. So you're, oh, I'm playing on my phone. Try. So they might be undercover cops, but they might be people too that are staking out the area, um, looking for uh, drug dealers to, to wait for them to leave so that they can go and they can burglarize the house. Um, people specifically watching the house, people that are driving by the house, going in circles. So if you're outside doing any work to the property and you see this same car that keeps driving around the area there, comes back, He's driving around the area. Mm -hmm. He's trying to figure out what you're doing. Fourth year marketing student, brown Cadillac, drives down the street and parks down there. Gets out of the car with a food styrofoam container. Walks back up the neighborhood and into the house. Comes out of the house without the styrofoam container, well dressed, goes over and gets in his brown Cadillac, light brown Cadillac, and drives away. And you don't think that's Meals on Wheels? Neighborhood <laughs> 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 yeah, walk. Yeah, well, we can talk about this. Absolutely. Right here in this town. Well, there's a lot of things that go on this town that aren't printed in the Manhattan Mercury. I can tell you that right now. No. <laughs> so, no. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> People that are having arguments with themselves. You see this quite a bit, and this could be. This could be a mental health issue. This could also be a drug abuse issue. A lot of times when they're been doing drugs for a while, it's really hard to make the distinction between, okay, is this person mentally ill or is this person used so many drugs that they've fried every brain cell that they had? So these are some, some things to be concerned about. Uh, if you're being followed, one of the uh, more severe crimes that we have here in Manhattan is we have a lot of burglaries. Residential, vehicular, some of that activity to be aware of is people that are walking down the street <coughs> and they're looking in windows. They may not be trying doors, but they're looking in windows. Walk down to the next car, looking in windows. There are on average about six, seven cops on duty at any given time. 
in the city of Manhattan, 60,000 people. You guys are our best eyes and ears out there. So if you see these things, contact us. Most of the time, we're not going to just roll up to somebody burglarizing a car. It's not going to happen. But if you are in your house or you're driving by and you see something that just doesn't fit, call us. We'll go and we'll investigate. The only thing that we need to stop somebody is reasonable suspicion that they are, have, or are going to commit a crime. So if you're able to articulate yourself to our dispatchers and say, hey, look, you know, there's this white male. He's got a backpack. He's looking in windows of several cars there. He's heading in this direction. Give us that information. If you call us and say, there's a black male that's in this neighborhood that doesn't belong, we're probably not going to send anybody. What's in the picture? You got to be able to say what the person's doing. Everybody carries a smartphone. Video. Take a picture. Don't put yourself in any risk. But we all have those tools that sometimes we don't think about at that time. <coughs> but we may be able to take that video and recognize who that person is. It's, there's been studies that have been done that say that about 90% of the crime is done by the same 10% of people. So like the police department, we have gone through iterations of extra patrols. So we've had initiative laser point. So we picked hotspot areas in town and said these areas based upon the crime here, um, vehicle burglaries, that they, they're basically at greater risk for having additional burglaries. So we'll go and we'll send units there and they'll send 15, 20 minutes in an area, they'll walk around, they'll drive around the area, they'll sit in a car and they'll be seen. The study says that about, after that officer leaves, you got about two to three hours where crime is drastically reduced just because that officer was present. So we're gonna put our people where the crime's at. We don't really patrol a whole lot on the west side of town because we don't really have a whole lot of crime on the west side of town, but occasionally we'll get those crime spurs where people will go out and you'll have a bunch of residential burglaries or a bunch of uh, vehicle burglaries. And we put our people where we need them. Because like I said, there's only six of us, six or seven of us. Um, people that are trying to open car doors, a lot of times we'll get calls around the Aggieville City Park area uh, where somebody will walk down 2, 3 o'clock in the morning or 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and they'll just start trying doors. They'll keep going. Like I said, you guys are our best eyes and ears out there to see things like that. Um, your ability to accurately give the information to our dispatcher, what gets it to us, is what's going to help us get that person and figure out what are you doing? Because I can demand an explanation for their activity because I have reasonable suspicion that they're committing a crime. I can articulate that, hey, you were seen trying to get into three or four cars. You've got a backpack on. It's two o'clock in the morning. What are you doing? What's your name? Where do you live? Where are you coming from? Occasionally you'll have people that will knock on your doors that you're not expecting anybody and they'll ask for somebody who doesn't live there. A lot of times this is something where somebody's trying to scope out, okay, who lives here? How many people live here? Do they have nice things? And they may come back at a later time when you're at work. So right. and the, drug, the druggers do that. The dealer will send the people around through the neighborhood to visit and they'll, and they'll go themselves and they'll see your 65 inch TV and they'll tell their customer the 65 inch TV is at this address right there. I want it in exchange for the drugs. That's, especially if they owe Miami, any money. That's Miami, 50 years in Miami. Yeah, especially if they owe any money. So salesmen, when you got salesmen that come to your door, all salesmen within the city of Manhattan are supposed to have a permit to solicit. There are some exceptions, and you have uh, charitable, educational, religious organizations, uh, things like that. Those are exempt from that. But everybody else that comes, the magazine salesmen, those are a big one. A lot of times what those people will do is they'll reply to some ad in the paper somewhere, and they'll all get the van from Oklahoma, and they'll just start driving through the Midwest. And they're going to come and they're going to knock on your door, and they don't have anything in their hand at first. Hey, I just want to talk to you a little bit. And then they reach back and 
you know, pull out little pamphlets. Oh, I can win a trip if you buy these magazines here. They gotta have a permit to do that, which means that they've been blessed and vested by the city. If they don't have those things, that's a crime. Contact us. Uh, nine times out of 10, we actually make a physical arrest on those people, if, especially because they don't have any local ties. We've been hearing on next door, uh, two people are going door to door and they were, and, and it's spotty. So we have an illegal landing at Capitol that happened in Northview, uh, and people are posting that they're, um, and it has happened over a couple of years that they're knocking and tr asking if they're there alone and asking if they would buy, or trying to sell common cleaning products like you might find at Walmart. Um, mm -hmm. And so people are just naturally suspicious, but uh, oh, absolutely. they will have their guard up somewhat, at least if they're hearing those stories. Absolutely, I mean, you get the Kirby vacuum salesmen yeah. too, and they're really, some of these guys are really good and they're really pushy. And they're gonna find a way in their house and it's really hard that once they're in your house yeah. to get them out. You know, I, most of the time I don't even answer my door at my own house, you know, which is, which is sad that, mm -hmm. but you have so many people. Now, Eagles Landing, that's how it's obviously Pottawatomie sure. County, and it's yeah. not covered. It's just happening on both sides of the river, though. So. Yeah, and, and I used to live in the North U area on Parker, and it was kind of the same thing. You know, you see a van come down the street, see people get out door to door to door, and inside the house, shut the door, pull the blinds, <laughs> you know, not home. Find a way to see if the door before you answer. Absolutely. And like I said, no one, no one says you have to answer your own door. But if you do, and you do come across a solicitor, ask to see their permit. Ask to see their ID. A lot of the utility guys that are meet, or reading your meters, uh, they're going to have West Star IDs. They're going to have City of Manhattan's. I've, I've actually seen the, the guys that read the, the water meters wear vests that say meter reader, and they're never going to knock on your door, mm -hmm. ever unless they need to get in your yard because there's a fence and they can't read it. The dog. But yeah, most of, the, most, of the, most of the people there that are legitimate, if they're gonna knock on your door, they're gonna bring a truck, they're gonna park it right out in front of your yard, it's gonna say West Star on it, it's gonna say Kansas Gas, it's gonna say City of Manhattan, they're gonna have some sort of photo ID that they're gonna show because they're, the organization requires that they do that, not the City of Manhattan, but the organization that they work for requires that. And the Mormons are identifiable on the Seventh-day Adventist, you can tell. <laughs> no, seriously. Bicycle can, helmets? You can tell. <laughs> yeah, I, it is. And, and like I said, it's, they're not really trying to solicit anything so they wouldn't fall under this city ordinance, per my understanding, because they're not trying to sell you and they're actually covered by the uh, religious organization. Yeah, they're not a threat. Yeah. yeah. Well, because they're because they're a religious organization, yeah. they're they're. But in the same sense, if you've asked them to leave and they won't leave, well, now we have a trespass issue. Right. So, so we can still ask them to leave. Doesn't have to be posted. No trespass. No. No. Oh, down in Fort Lauderdale, you gotta have a sign. So your property is your property, whether you're renting it, whether you're owning it. Um, if you live there, you have rights to, to not have people to trespass on your property. So usually landlords, when they need to get into a place, they'll give at least 24 hours of posted notice. And I, I, I'm not gonna put what the rules are because I don't know what they are. But uh, you know, they'll say, hey, look, I'm, or they'll try to make good effort to, to, to let them know that they're gonna be coming in the house the next, within the next week and spraying for bugs or things like that. Um, but. Like I said, most, most of these people will have IDs. Um, package thefts, especially around the holidays, around just after Black Friday, when everybody starts getting their Amazon packages. <laughs> so if you see somebody walk up, grab a package, get back in their car and drive away, especially if you're familiar with the area and don't know that, or know that they don't live there, um, call us. What we're gonna wanna know is the police we're gonna to wanna to know the gender. We're gonna to wanna to know the race, the clothing, the hairstyle. Do they have any facial hair? Do they have any tattoos? What's their height? What's their weight? If you don't know all of these, that's fine. But give us a little bit more than there's a man that's walking down the street and he went east. It helps us when we have officers in the area, we'll swarm the area with officers to be able to coordinate and check and go back and forth there. Direction of travel is a good one. 
license plates. If you can get a license plate, get a license plate. If you can't, don't put yourself at any risk. Don't go out, stand next to the car, take a picture of it. Don't do any of those things. But if you can see it, you know what it is, provide that information. Uh, going along with that, what's the color of the car? What's the model of the car? What's the make of the car? Those information also very helpful to us. In Phoenix, they won't take a report unless you have the license tag number. If we so have suspicion of a crime, so we're going to file a report. Level of crime. Yeah, they won't take the call unless you've got the license plate number. Some of the contact information we have, we have our non-emergent, so if it's not an emergent issue, it's just the 785-537-2112. You can also report anonymously to uh, Riley County, Manhattan Crime Stoppers, 539-7777, or if it's an emergent situation, always call 911. Any questions? Yes, sir. So how many officers are on the street? On, on a given day, about seven at a time. Now so we have some shifts that overlap with each other. So right now, we've got about six officers on the street in Manhattan. At uh, 12 so where are the other 45? <laughs> we have four shifts. Each shift has about, like I said, five to six people on that. That usually includes a supervisor and a corporal. So you'll have anywhere from four to five assigned to actual areas. So we just take Manhattan. Right down the middle. Northwest, southwest, southeast, northeast. And those are their areas. So you have a specific officer in that specific That's area the there. Control division. Correct. Correct. So we have detectives that are assigned, obviously, to investigations. And there's probably about 17 sworn officers or so in investigations. I want to say we have 73 officers in patrol, but that includes uh, some of the leadership there. So lieutenants, patrol captain, sergeants, uh, patrol officers like myself and SROs, school resource officers. So we have two in the schools here. I think we've got one up north uh, in Riley. But with those four shifts officers, there, like I said, there's some overlap. So at 12 o'clock today, we're gonna have six more officers come on. So actually we'll have 12 from that time, uh, from 12 to, to five. And then our shift will go off duty at five. And there'll be another shift that will come in at five and they'll bring four or five officers. But currently right now, there's six officers on duty. So. Can you go back to the slide with the phone numbers? Yes. <coughs> Any other questions? So you got more out in the county, right? We've got two officers assigned to the county, uh, one of which is in the school in Riley, and then another one, uh, Mark Cusimano, is currently on duty in the county. So the officers that live up where I know they're living in the north part of the county. I've seen them respond to calls. Yes, yeah, right they'll, yeah. If it's if it's an emergent life or death situation or neighborhood, yeah, I mean they'll go put their pistol belt on and their blue jeans and a shirt and they'll they'll respond because there's is some time that it takes for us to get right. from the city there. But there's always somebody that's, that's available. That's right. Further northern, further northern cop is supposed to have the access to the vehicle, so yeah, they, they have to come and get the vehicle and go back. Yes, uh, a lot of those have take-home cars. There are some that don't, right? Because they don't live in the in the north part of the county. There are some that live in Pot County. In the department, I came out of Kansas City, and we push that for every officer to have a vehicle when they last so much longer in the whole study, and I support that. I want you to go to the city commission meeting and tell them that we need cars for every officer. I like the way they I don't have a button. Hold. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to say thank you because I have found that you guys are very responsive. Whenever we've called or asked a question or reported something, um, one of the team in Humboldt, your cards are frequently parked at the, at the Manhattan Art Center. Um, we've been designated to high crime areas sometimes, and you guys are always there. And um, I, I really appreciate that, so I say thank you. You're very welcome. The service we're happy to provide, and hopefully we can head the crime off before anybody becomes a victim. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, we're doing a lot of traffic things like that too. So there's a lot of areas in town, especially anywhere from about 14th Street to Walmart on Blue, uh, Anderson Bluemont there where it's, we have a lot of high accident areas there. So we're trying to stop for a lot of those things. 
based upon a, a study that Kansas State University did last year, and not to get sidetracked, but they basically asked the citizens of Manhattan, what do you want the Riley County Police Department to focus in on for traffic reduction? So they came up with a list of things, uh, distracted driving, so that's cell phones, uh, talking, texting, playing with the radio, reading books, shaving, I've seen some weird things that people are doing while they're driving. So, uh, distracted driving, following too close, um, so if you're following probably within two car lengths of the person in front of you, depending on what speed you're going there. We're doing a lot more stops with that, trying to prevent any type of rear end collisions. Uh, impaired driving, so drugs, DUI, things like that. Uh, running red light stop signs. So you got a lot of people that, they're in a hurry to get home. So, you know, hey, that light, uh, it's, it's yellow and I got time to stop, but if I gas it, I can get through, so the light turns red and then they cross the line and go through. So we're trying to crack down on that. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing extra enforcement. So when you see us in those areas, we might be doing the, the high crime designation stuff, but we might also be doing some of the traffic things in order to try to prevent accidents from happening. I just got quite <coughs> that. We were talking to our insurance agent yesterday, and he said that um, insurance, auto insurance rates are going up across the country because of distracted drivers. Cell phones is the number one killer of people in automobile accidents more than DUI. And that says a lot, that you, you have a better chance of not harming somebody by being drunk or impaired on drugs than you do with your cell phone. And that's, that's a huge issue here. I mean, I, it's, it's hard to see in a patrol car because everybody can see me coming for a, a, a couple blocks away, but a lot of times when I pull up to the light, they never even see me coming and they're, they're texting and look over and I'm like, hey. <laughs> yes, sir. On uh, determining whether you have a building that's contaminated with drugs, is mm -hmm. there a governmental agency and or a local vendor that can do the testing? Um, I think MFD has some of the resources there. Uh, they, they we have a test. yeah, we have a, uh, a hazmat team at Riley County. It's a regional asset that uh, responds to you know different municipalities within the area there uh, they're going to have access to the specialized tools and testers um, is, is if there's somebody that, if you're asking if there's somebody that you can call outside of that there probably is but I don't know I don't know. yeah I don't know who it is uh, but a lot of times like I said the MFD will have those resources and then we have our hazmat team too they, they have the, the, the sensors that can sniff the air and tell um, to, to look for those things there. But I mean, I, I couldn't go in and walk in and say, yeah, probably nobody should probably live here. I mean, it's obviously gonna take some specialized equipment, so. Thank you for explaining the story about the traffic study. It was a pickup truck sitting in the mall parking at uh, Leavenworth and Tuttle Creek Boulevard all last year, it's gone now. And I always ask people and wonder, what is that guy and sometimes his wife sitting in that park in that I thought maybe they were watching high beat for a theft or something. But he sat there the entire year at that intersection in that shopping mall every day. And now of course they're gone and the studies over. But I didn't have any idea what could possibly be going on. But you notice things like that that are unusual. That you you know, nobody in the parking lot except this guy every day. Right there. We've got a lot of calls recently about people that will sit in parking lots, especially if they're close to schools, uh, close to uh, healthcare facilities, places like that. And one of the things that I found has been strange is a lot of those are Uber drivers. Uber? Yeah. So they're, you know, they'll, they'll park and they'll sit in the car and they'll wait for a fare. So, and I don't know if you're familiar with Uber, but essentially there's a there's an app on your phone that you can download, and uh, it shows where where you're at as the Uber driver, and somebody says, hey, I need a ride over here, and they prepay on their phone, so then they come and pick you up and take you wherever, kind of like a taxi service, but much cleaner. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you see those things, still call them in because it is odd, but there was, there was a guy a couple weeks ago that he was getting called in every day. He was outside of a daycare in a, in a, in a parking lot next to a church every single day. And every time that we would go to respond, you know, he would be gone. The one time we caught up with him and we asked him, what are you doing? I'm an Uber driver. And he showed the credentials that he's an Uber driver and it made sense, you know, for him to be there. But he's just parking in a centralized 
area with somebody <coughs> asking to take them somewhere. After breakfast, they come out to the car. I didn't realize it was near a bank and listened to the K-Man program at 9 o'clock. And the bank was having you guys come over and knock on the window. What are you doing? Well, now I moved a block away from the bank to sit and listen to the car radio. Because I fall asleep, you know, during the program. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 